Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Quickly, if you're new to the channel, even if you're old to the channel, please hit like, please hit subscribe. We found out that about 40% of you that watch this show regularly are not subscribers. Hit subscribe. It's a passive gesture. Costs you nothing. It does wonders for the channel. I also hit the notification bell so you're alerted whenever we go live as we're constantly doing crazy shows at crazy times at crazy days of the week. So when you're notified, you know whenever we go live. Also, before we start, I want to let you all know that Everyday Analysis is doing a second edition. <laughs> Oops. Wrong sound effect. If I was a teenage anarchist. So if you go to the website and says it's sold out, it's not. Actually, you should go to the website. It should say second edition available. And Alfie told me the second edition is going to look better than the first. Because there's a new printer and everything's going to look great. No champagne room tonight. This is a pre-recorded episode. And I will be spending the entire weekend. Well, we'll have spent the entire weekend getting the kayfabe documentary all done. The director is moving in here for a few days. We're not leaving the place until we have that all put to bed. Now, let's dive into what you guys are here for. And I'm sure many of you saw the title and go, what is this guy talking about Stalinist realism? That was the first thing I said when I saw Alfie, the publisher at Everyday Analysis, post another book, mini book. These are all cool little mini book pamphlets which I really, really like because let's be honest, how many of you are really reading 350 page, 400 page books, especially ones that are like super dense, right? So I love the pamphlet format, but Alfie posted a picture of a book called Stalinist Realism. And as soon as I saw it and I saw a little description, I was like, what do I have to do to get the author on the show? And let's talk a little bit today about what Stalinist realism is. And let's talk a little bit about identity. Many of you that are watching this program have been confronted with Mark Fisher's capitalist realism theory. That capitalism is such a dominating force in our lives that we can see no other way around it. We can envision the end of the world before we can imagine a world without capitalism. Well, our guest today wants to combat another reality that he believes plagues us on the left, and that is what he calls Stalinist realism and our ideas around identity. From the mini book Stalinist Realism and Identity, the rotten underbelly is the equally potent and toxic story that tells us that there is only one alternative, a fixed worldview functional to what remains of the old workers' estates which is a caricature of Marxism and which is obsessed with identities, some identities that are marked out as progressive and the rest are marked out as degenerate, quote, woke. That rotten underbelly is Stalinist realism. Capitalist realism has always entailed a thoroughly psychologized view of the world, one that reduces society which we are told does not exist to individual men and women and their families. Stalinist realism, no less, is a poisonous false alternative that traps us in the same kinds of binaries of bodies, male and female, and ethnicities, progressive and reactionary camps. So we need to unravel the identity claims made by the psi professions and by those who want to define what counts as a category and what does not. Stakes are material, and so the analysis needs to be materialist. An analysis undertaken from here from the standpoint of open communism. That is from the book Stalinist Realism and Identity. Please welcome the author, Dr. Ian Parker. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm very cold, but uh, I'm okay. <laughs> yes, we were saying before we started that it's negative three. Yeah. Oh, oh, 
I won't complain living here in Mexico that it dropped down to 60 degrees then. Um, but Dr. Parker, thank you again for making time and joining me today to do this show. Um, I do understand it's early evening where you are in the UK. Um, when did you come up with this Stalinist realism theory? Uh, and what events were bringing you to this conclusion? Can you well, it was uh, it was named for me by one of my comrades okay. uh, as we were talking about what was happening in the world at the moment mm -hmm. in the conflict between two different camps, or it looks as if it's a conflict between two different camps in the world, between the, the Western capitalist states, uh, which we are charged to undermine and overthrow and try and build an alternative to um, and the other side that is Putin's Russia, Xi Jinping's China and the rest which pose as being a progressive alternative and I think the mistake that a lot of people on the left make is thinking that the enemy of your enemy is your friend and of course mm -hmm. that's not true the enemy of your enemy might also be your enemy, as we've seen with the crackdown inside Russia and the mm. crackdown on workers' rights inside China. So we need a way of thinking about that double threat, not only the threat from global capitalism in the West, mm. but also the threat that comes from authoritarian states that uh, present themselves as an alternative to capitalism, but are no alternative at all that actually are going to land us in a huge mess if we start to side with them. So this, this phrase, Stalinist realism, is to capture the nature of that trap, that uh, problem that we're, that we're posed with when it seems as if uh, these, uh, these wretched, uh, miserable authoritarian states uh, an alternative to capitalism. It's interesting that you say that um, one of our comrades and uh, people on the show, Jean Bajlan, wrote a piece, um, I think it got published in Compact, about uh, anti-imperialism and kind of the way that it's being viewed is, is very similar to what you're talking about. A lot of the uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend, kind of uh, uh, China, is doing great work in Africa because they're not imperialist like the United States. They don't have 800 military bases. So any country that doesn't have 800 military bases um, must be doing the right thing. Um, do you think also that because we're dealing with, especially in the US left, I can't speak for the United Kingdom where you are, um, the left or what we would call a left, my co-host says we don't have a left, we have leftists in the US. Um, it's in its embryonic stages. I, I say a lot of this is coming out of 2016, 2015 Bernie um, run where people can say words like socialism again and feel comfortable saying them. Um, but another thing that I'm seeing is that there seems to be, because when you say that you're a socialist, right? Because we have to admit that, again, because it's in its embryonic stages, there are people that are looking at their leftism as a brand identity almost. Um, you're confronted with some of the failures of communism. You're confronted with Stalin. And there seems to almost be a look back at Stalin as, oh, it really wasn't that bad. Stalin did a lot of things right. Do you see that as well in, in the United Kingdom? Yeah, sure, it's very potent here in the United Kingdom. I think people are so desperate to find an alternative that they look at what's happening in other places and they hope, they hope, desperately hope, that that will provide a force that will uh, combat the capitalism that we're suffering in, in our own country. Um, and in a way, it's understandable. Uh, and in my own trajectory into Marxism, I was uh, tempted in that direction as well. I mean, I started off uh, in a group, working with a group called the Communist Party of Britain, Marxist-Leninist, uh, which was really pro-China. 
Um, we read um, The State and Revolution by Lenin. Um, we learned something about the nature of the capitalist state. And then they uh, wanted us to read uh, Foundations of Leninism by Joseph Stalin. And I started to read up about Stalin. And I realized that this was a pretty uh, grim alternative. Uh, that if you're going to end up with labor camps and oppression and also anti-Semitism, which is one of the things that mm -hmm. I address in this pamphlet, uh, in the third essay, if you're going to end up with all of those things, then, then you really got a problem here. And so I was drawn to Trotskyism as a form of revolutionary Marxism that is critical of capitalism, wants to overthrow capitalism, but is also um, intent on bringing about a political revolution in the Soviet Union and in China that will bring genuine democratic workers' control in those countries. Democratic workers' control that needs to be internationalist, that needs to think beyond the national boundaries and to think about the way that we can work together against uh, these different nation states that in their own different ways are intent on retaining power, retaining power for the capitalist class in the West and in the Soviet Union and China, intent on retaining the power of the bureaucracy and now in both Russia and China, retaining the power of the new capitalist class that has uh, emerged since 1989. Mm. What do you say to people that tell you, well, China is uh, communist. It's just a different kind of, uh, it's communism with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I have been in China a number of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have e even taught in one of the Marxist colleges uh -huh. in one of the universities inside China. And mm -hmm. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, I was there to try and make a link uh, between Marxist theory and practice and the head of the college who was there in the class with us um, pulled me into line by reminding us that uh, what the students are interested in is not changing the world, but actually understanding what they called the belief system of our party. So very, very clearly here, you have um, Marxist ideas and communist ideas being used as a kind of faith system, the faith system of the bureaucracy, rather than as a, as a tool to uh, engage with and empower people and to, to change reality. That's the way that the communist and Marxist rhetoric works inside China. It's used as a tool uh, to enforce obedience and to bring people into line. That's, that's, that's the difference between uh, what they call leftism in mm -hmm. China which they're against, uh, and Marxism as a belief system. That's interesting that you, and you say this in the book, too, you talk about a kind of a religion, that Marx is a religion, and it does feel, there. there is a feeling of a certain fervor, especially when you're around like a really new leftist <laughs> when it comes to their understanding of Marx. And, you know, now we no longer have to try to decipher dense texts you know, the Communist Manifesto isn't that long of a book, but it, it is a dense text, and it's written in the 1800s. Um, now you can watch a TikTok video that's two minutes long. Let me explain it to you, right? Um, how do you try to, because you're, you're someone you talk to students, how do you try to decipher the myth of Marxism as a religion and more of a theory to people? I think what you've got to do is go back to basics and look at what Marx was up to when he produced his critical analysis of the capitalist economic system. Uh, and what he did was come to an analysis in Capital, which was subtitled A Critique of Political Economy. And what he was doing there was engaging with the political economists who were justifying capitalism as the only historical 
uh, progressive system that could exist in the world. Uh? Mm -hmm. uh, so what he was doing was showing that in its own terms, capitalism was intensely exploitative and unfair and would involve all kinds of oppression, including colonial oppression and uh, in the work of his co-writer, Frederick Engels, also gender oppression, that uh, this capitalist system, which presented itself as being open and fair and democratic, was actually at its heart deeply exploitative. It required exploitation. Mm -hmm. And it exploited those who had to sell their labor power in order to survive. That is the working class. That mm -hmm. is all of us, you know, whether we work in factories or we work in tech or we work in universities, we're all workers who have to sell our labor power to enable these, uh, these enterprises to keep running, to make a profit. And what Marx was arguing was that this labor power that we all sell is a source of creativity and power. If only we could seize it and democratically control it and be able to determine uh, our own destinies rather than have them decided by a class that wanted to make a profit and would destroy us and destroy the world if necessary in order to retain uh, uh, their profits and boost their profits. So that's what Marx was up to. Now, once you grasp that, you start to see that Marxism is a tool to understand and overthrow capitalism. It's not a complete worldview. It's simply a tool that emerges at a particular time in history to understand a political economic system, capitalism, that has emerged through the 18th and 19th centuries and becomes a globalized force through the, through the 19th and 20th centuries. That's what Marxism is. It's a tool for us as workers to understand this exploitative system and to be able to collectively mobilize in order to destroy it and to build an alternative. I mean, that's great. <laughs> what do you say to people that talk about cultural Marxism on the, well, on the kind of intellectual <laughs> dark web they used to call it? I yeah. guess you would call it the right now. There's more and more books call, coming out that surprising me about this idea around the cultural Marxists. What do you say to them? Well, cultural Marxism is a, a kind of code word used on the right to um, complain about the uh, influence of leftist ideas that um, they see as seeping into society and undermining the forms of order that they love, that they are wedded to. And those forms of order, depending on the people who use this term cultural Marxism as a kind of abuse term, mm -hmm. these forms of order might involve the right to private property in its classic form, that's capitalism. But they also love forms of order that are to do with the control of women mm -hmm. and the, uh, uh, the, the, the institution of the family. As a, as, a, as, a, as a form of order. Uh, they also like forms of order that uh, keep white people at the top and colonial and uh, people from uh, different nations right at the bottom in their place. So they kind of get angry at people who are starting to challenge those forms of order. And so cultural Marxism is, is a term of abuse that is used uh, against anyone who seems to threaten them, seems to threaten their privilege, or, and this is even sadder, mm -hmm. anyone who seems to threaten the privilege that they would like when they look at people with power and they want to be powerful as well. Mm. I mean, a lot of cultural Marxism is, is thrown at the Wokies. 
right? And you speak to that in your Stalinist realism. Is there a through line between the Stalinist realist and the New Age right winger? I think there is a connection here, and the connection is very clear and very material in the ways in which the inheritors of the Stalinist bureaucracies, and I'm talking here about Putin in Russia in particular, the ways in which those inheritors of the Stalinist apparatus, who now speak for the new ruling class inside Russia, the ways in which they then link up with right-wing forces in other parts of the world. So we can see it very clearly in the funding that Putin has been given to the Front National in France, Marine Le Pen mm -hmm. has been getting plenty of funding from Putin to boost a French nationalist agenda. We see it in Putin's funding and friendliness to the Orban regime in Hungary, uh, which, you know, is, is a really terrible uh, uh, regime and numerous other other uh, instances where Putin is propping up right wing forces because they're functional to him. They're useful to him as strong state actors in the West that he can then link with and negotiate with. So in a way, Stalinist realism is a kind of update of the old traditional Stalinist peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. between the Soviet Union and the West. That mm -hmm. old peaceful coexistence meant that the communist parties were turned from being tools of revolution mm -hmm. into diplomatic tools of the Soviet state. So it's kind of there was the nationalism filtered down into each communist party as they put uh, put their uh, their own interests of their working class um, under the interests of the of the Soviet state. Is so, this yeah, is the Soviet it. project, in your opinion, was it an imperialist project as well? Just not as as wide ranging as the uh, U.S. Uh, imperialist project. Well, it certainly had it certainly had colonial uh, elements to it, in the way that the Russian center uh, oppressed national minorities mm -hmm. inside Russia, uh, inside the Soviet Union, um, and we can see this in the treatment of the Tatars, for example, in Crimea, the removal of of populations from one part of the Soviet Union to another. Uh, and we can see it in China as well, in the, the treatment of national minorities uh, there. In each case, you've got a strong central state that operates in a colonial way in relation to its own national minorities. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that before 1989, either Russia or China was, strictly speaking, imperialist, Mm -hmm. But now that uh, capitalism has been restored in Russia and China, there's certainly an elements of imperialism there, and that we can see that imperialism in the case of Russia in its treatment of Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, and the kind of weird ideology that Putin comes out with, which uh, at the one moment... Uh, blames the Ukrainians for being fascist en masse, mm -hmm. as if they're a homogeneous kind of group and everyone thinks the same. Mm -hmm. That's a racist form of reasoning. And denying that there's any such thing as the Ukrainian nation. You know, these kind of contradictory things operate as part of the ideology um, of, of imperialism, you know, always in relation to colonial peoples. Either um, they, they're causing trouble uh, and they behave in bad ways and uh, disrupt things, or they don't exist and, you know, they, we, we don't need to take them seriously. Same yeah. thing happens in the case of China uh, in its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which rolls across Asia yeah. and into Africa and uh, leads to the, the Chinese making some really bizarre alliances with dodgy regimes uh, in Africa.
Yeah, people don't really like to talk about that aspect of the Belt and Road, and and you know we won't we won't have to get into all of that today. Um, let's get back to your book. In the book, you write the homogenizing of identity is one of the trademarks of Stalinist realisms. Um, while the working class of each nation was expected to follow its own quote road to socialism, the British road become becoming the self-description of the communist party of great britain britain adhering to the logic of socialism in one country for instance jews who did not identify with israel and even inside the soviet bloc those that did were accused of being cosmopolitans in the worldview of stalinist realism cosmopolitan becomes the new negative code word for what was once in marxism and the bolshevik party that brought about the Russian Revolution, positive, inclusive internationalism. What we could now term, quote, open communism. Can you explain what you mean by the term open communism? Well, what I understand by open communism is the historical development, which starts with Marx mm -hmm. in the first international, working with the anarchists, that is developed uh, in alliance with social democrats of different kinds in the second international that is there in the founding of the third international after the russian revolution in an attempt to um in an attempt to work with the diversity of the working class mm -hmm. so internationalism is is doesn't mean that everyone kind of like is obedient to one center which tells you how you should behave internationalism is precisely about the diversity of the working class the mm. fact that uh, you know when we look at the working class developing in manchester in the 19th century for example it's mm. mostly women when we look at the working class developing in manchester in the 19th century and those who build the canals that uh, transport the cotton uh, backwards and forwards from Liverpool to Manchester. We said they're Irish, you know? So it's kind of like the, 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 the working class is always composed of many, many different oppressed sectors who come together, work together to form a, a communist movement that can overthrow capitalism. So that, that, that is absolutely crucial to our understanding of open communism. And we can see that at work in the Russian revolution when the working class unites for the task of overthrowing czarism mm. and then overthrowing capitalism in October, 1917. But it does it not through coming together in one homogeneous block, but actually coming together in its strength in its diversity. So you have many different social movements appearing. You have feminist movements, you have movements of the national minorities mm -hmm. in the south of the uh, Soviet Union. You have different communist parties that are in their majority still practicing Muslims, you know? So even uh, atheism is not required as a party ideology in order for you to be able to call yourself a communist. What you have is a learning of each group from each other in its diversity and a, a conception of the world, a communist world, as a world in which we can change who we are, transform ourselves and adopt different identities, different standpoints to understand the world from the position of women, to understand from the position of the colonized, to understand the world from the position of the religiously oppressed, to understand the world from the working class in its diversity. That's what open communism is. What what would you, so if someone said, well, that sounds a little bit like a united front strategy, you're, you're getting with different, uh, you know, social Democrats and, and communists and anarchists, you know, that doesn't really work. What do you say then? Uh, I would say it does work. It does work when the United Front is respectful of the differences inside it. And mm -hmm. that we have an opportunity not only to work together, but we also have an opportunity to debate with each other and to learn from each other. 
I think the watchwords of the United Front is that we march separately and strike together. That's, that's how we work. And that's very different from a traditional Stalinist conception of the popular front. In a Stalinist conception of the popular front, you make an alliance with supposedly uh, progressive bourgeois figures mm -hmm. and you close things down so that the popular front only operates around that agreed program so that you end up suppressing any disagreement within it and the stalinists will work in concert with the progressive bourgeois figures or what they see as progressive capitalists or progressive national liberation leaders they'll work hand in hand with those uh, capitalist forces in order to uh, enforce obedience inside the popular front so i would say if we're thinking about different ways in which we can operate together the popular front is a dead end something that leads us to conformity and obedience and the united front is a way of working together where it's more alive and open to disagreement and open to debate so that we have the strength and the confidence to be able to strike together when we do move into action against capitalism <sighs> now let's get into some of these identity arguments that you make in your book um i guess let's start with israel why do you think stalin supported the creation of israel and you know you say that stalinist realism is going to lead you to anti-semitism yeah it's a very it's a very tricky argument this one um and i think it uh it, it flows from stalin in stalin's own um sense of cosmopolitans as being a threat to the unity of the soviet state so what stalin did and i think this is one of the great betrayals of the russian revolution from 1924 onwards when stalin took power at the head of the communist party what stalin did was to start to see internationalism not as an energizing progressive force that would work across national state boundaries mm. and dismantle nation states okay but he saw it instead he saw internationalism itself as a threat and what he put in place of internationalism was an alliance of different nation states a most important nation state for stalin of course was the soviet state mm -hmm. which was a state in which russia was dominant and that russian or soviet nation state could then make alliances with other strong states around the world that it could do diplomatic deals with and that was a more reassuring um, ordered kind of world for stalin uh, to operate in at the head of the bureaucracy now it's from that that you have the kind of form of ideology that i call stalinist realism developing because mm. it turns marxism from being an internationalist form of open communism into a closed ideology of the state apparatus in order to buttress the Soviet state and then in a different form uh, in China to buttress the Chinese state uh, after the Chinese revolution happens and Mao seizes control there and has his own disagreements with Stalin about who should be the top dog <laughs> but, but what you have here is a transformation 
of internationalism from being a positive force in the eyes of the Soviet Union and Stalin into being a threat. And that's where cosmopolitanism uh, becomes a code word for the bad kind of internationalism that they want to, 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 to suppress. They want to get rid of. Now, what, 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 what do the Jews do inside Russia? The Jews have been arguing since before the Russian Revolution for an internationalist ethos. They've always been accused of being rootless cosmopolitans. They've always been accused of not having proper allegiance to their yeah. own nation state. That's the case in Germany. That's the case in every state where they live. That's part of the anti-Semitism that they suffer. You're disloyal. You aren't, you aren't loyal to this nation state. You have other interests which are beyond this nation state. And the Jews inside Russia also pose that kind of threat to Stalin. They are they are the they are the um, quintessential cosmopolitans in this kind of bad version of internationalism that is now seen as a threat by Stalin, and so he wants to confine them. He wants to uh, know who exactly is a Jew and to define the identity of Jews, mm -hmm. and he wants to confine them. And he then develops Birubijan over on the border near China as a separate place where the Jews can go and live and he could, they can be out of the way. And so they, some of them are transported to Birubijan and are kept out of the way there. And the other Jews who remain in the rest of the Soviet Union are subjected to increasingly intense anti-Semitism. And this comes to a head. Mm in 1953, just before Stalin dies, when he becomes convinced that there's a doctor's plot, uh, which is a plot by Jewish doctors to, mm -hmm. to assassinate him, okay? All part of the cosmopolitan conspiracy uh, mm -hmm. against, against the Soviet Union. Now, I think that uh, the terrible tragedy of the Holocaust which led many well-meaning uh, supporters uh, of, of the Jews to think that they would have a solution to uh, the problem of anti-Semitism after the Second World War and after the Holocaust, to think that there would be a solution by putting them in a safe place for them having their own state mm. in Palestine, that was a very attractive option for Stalin. And that's why Stalin supported the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. If he couldn't put the Jews in Birubijan over near the Chinese border, then at least the Jews could be put uh, into this place in Palestine uh, in the State of Israel. And then maybe uh, it would be possible to, to, to do deals with, with that that new state as a state which has its own form of order, its own military apparatus, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 would be a kind of kind of people that Stalin could 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 do a deal with. Mm, that he could have, you know, military and financial influence over. Well, in fact, um, you know, the Haganah, uh, the, uh, the the Zionist shock troops that were so uh, efficient in driving Palestinians out of their homes mm -hmm. in 1948, mm -hmm. were armed by, uh, by, uh, by Czechoslovakia uh, with, the, with the agreement of, of, of Stalin. Yeah? It, it was functional to the Soviet bloc as a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. It was functional to the Soviet bloc to, uh, to, 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 uh, to support the formation of this state of Israel. And I have to say that that caused huge problems for the Palestine Communist Party, you know, <laughs> because, you know, their, their hero in the Soviet Union was actually responsible for bringing out a catastrophe uh, in 1948 with the formation of the State of Israel. And um, 
the building of what eventually became an apartheid state, uh, which uh, eventually, with the passing of the nation state law, uh, uh, defined Israel as a state of the Jewish people uh, with, uh, with the Palestinians as second class citizens, those, those who lived inside the, the state's borders. Yeah, still to this day, indefinitely uh, tragic. I, I read in the newspaper uh, this morning as I woke up that uh, Israel's like, well, ceasefire's done. Back to uh, back to indiscriminately bombing these people again. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I mean, it is interesting uh, that uh, since the formation of the state of Israel. Um, and the then the collapse of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. that there have been many people have emigrated from the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, have emigrated from Russia uh, into Israel. And there's anxiety there inside Israel that many of these people who've come in are not Jews at all. They just wanted to get out of Russia. So they pretend to be Jews and they, they come to come to Israel and uh, then they uh, they carry on voting for right right wing parties mm -hmm. uh, using their postal ballots uh, uh, back in Russia. Insane. Um, you speak in the book about how revolutionary Marxists should view class not as an identity, but a relation. Can you explain what you mean there the differences between identity and class? Yeah, I mean, this is this is going back to Marx again in his analysis of what the working class is. Mm -hmm. So for Marx, as he's talking about the emergence of capitalism in the 19th century, he's defining capitalism itself as a particular kind of social relation. Mm -hmm. And that means that the classes that exist under capitalism are defined by their relation to each other. That is, they're not substances, you know, they're not, they're not things that come into the world from outside, mm -hmm. you know, a group that says, oh, like, we're the capitalists, and here they arrive in capitalism, and they have control of the means of production and another class that's called the working class that comes onto the stage and says, aha, we are the working class, and then they meet each other and there's a conflict. No, for Marx, the relation between the capitalist class and the working class is a relation that develops historically. And Marx even goes so far as to say that the emergence of capitalism creates the working class that is it creates the working class as a force that can come together and realize a common interest that common interest should be to overthrow capitalism and to take the world in its own hands but it creates that working class which then comes to think of itself as having some kind of identity but what is weird about this identity is that it's not a fixed identity. It's an identity that is emerged historically. It is realized, experienced and put into action at a particular moment for the working class to be able to seize control. And then Marx's understanding of this is that with the abolition of capitalism, you actually have the abolition of class as well. So you don't have the identity of the working class as a fixed thing that existed way back into prehistoric times or as a fixed thing that will exist far into the future under capitalism. No, working class as an identity is something that appears at a particular historical moment out of the relationship with capitalism. Mm -hmm. So relation forms identity and we claim identity as working class in order to operate as a political force that will bring about our liberation. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of talk that I've seen. Um, I don't know if you see it as well about the idea that the working class is not the quote revolutionary subject. Um, and it feels like kind of new left talk from the sixties all over again, um, disassociating from the working class because they're too reactionary. What do you say to that thought process? I say maybe this uh, misunderstands what the nature of ideology is mm -hmm. and the ways in which different sections of the working class are not only bought off, which is true, there are mm -hmm. kind of layers of the working class that then have an interest in retaining their limited privileges mm -hmm. under capitalism, but also a kind of... Um, a kind of romanticizing of the working class and a kind of disappointed anger, disappointed anger on the part of radicals that this working class isn't moving quickly enough and it's not uh, kind of like performing its kind of uh, its destiny. Huh? Okay, so mm -hmm. that, I think that's that's something that's going on there in this uh, in this. Uh, idea that the working class has turned from being a revolutionary force into a reactionary force. If you actually look at the working class, mm -hmm. you find there's plenty of activity going on. Mm -hmm. But the activity is activity in conflict, conflict and contradiction, as the working class is working through what what is oppression? What is exploitation? What kind of strategies will be possible in order to 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 to, to bring about progressive change? I mean, you're in academia, so I'm sure you're you're privy to these conversations as well. Um, and it, it, I was talking to a, a fellow comrade about this the other night. Uh, we were doing a stream about the death of Kissinger. And after we wrapped up, we, um, it's okay to smile a little bit. We don't have to relish too much in it, but it's okay. Um, and, and, you know, he was voicing his concerns about kind of this, this same thought process that the working class isn't revolutionary enough. And it feels like to me, and maybe this is me reading too much into it, but you're the psychoanalyst. So I need you to help me with this. It feels like to me that, certain parts of the intelligentsia want to be the revolutionary force in this idea of revolution. And again, it feels like the sixties all over again, where the revolution is going to happen through, through academia and not through the working class because the working class is too reactionary in, in their assessment. But what I find interesting about that is we're seeing the working class starting to rise up, but again, I'm only going to speak in the United States context, but there's also you know, big strikes in India happened uh, not too long ago. We're seeing large, massive uh, labor strikes where people are starting to understand the only thing that we have to fight capital is withholding our labor and, and doing it in mass. Um, we even saw recently in San Francisco, California, where there was the big APAC conference, um, these mass demonstrations were not like 2003, where it's just a bunch of people getting up and saying no, and then going back home. These were mass demonstrations that were aligned with, you know, different Palestinian peace movements that were definitely aligned with different labor unions saying that we will shut everything down because we need to bring attention to the fact that this conference is highlighting these labor struggles in different parts of the developing world that we don't get attention to and we're destroying the planet you know it's it's a lot of, it was a lot of things at once it wasn't just one you know ecological strike it was a strike for the ecological destruction of the planet and you know labor struggles uh I was fascinated to see that and the coordination that it took to, to do that. And then to, to come back and see people talk about, nah, these people aren't really revolutionary because most of them are reactionary anyway. They can't even get a union in Amazon. 
what is your response to that kind of thinking yeah it does uh, it does annoy me as well uh, when i hear this kind of uh, this kind of disparaging of the desperate attempts of people to organize themselves and uh, i think it kind of flows from a kind of idealization of the working class as being a homogeneous force that should exist in a certain form, an idealized form, a romanticized form of the working class that should then be able to operate as the Marxist academic or as the leftist academic would like them to be. Mm -hmm. That is, what you have expressed there mm -hmm. is a kind of fantasy of what that working class is like, a romanticized idealized fantasy of that working class as being one fixed thing. Mm -hmm. uh? And it's when the working class appears in reality as something contradictory, as something struggling to realize itself, that the leftist academics or those who have disappointed in some way start to become a little anxious and start to become a little bit angry and disparaging of what is actually happening mm -hmm. in the in the really real existing disparate labor movements that's it's it's uh, it's it's something which i think is symptomatic of the hold not only of capitalist realism mm -hmm. in which we're told that the world can't change because capitalism is the only game in town but also the hold of what I analyze in this little pamphlet mm -hmm. that is Stalinist realism, which holds to its own idealized, fixed view of what the working class is, rather than taking seriously and valuing the diversity of the working class, the working class as, as minority, the working class as black, the working class as woman, the working class as lesbian and gay and queer and trans, all of those things coming into the mix in which people get a sense of their power and become confident in struggle and are better able then to work together in a kind of what we describe later as a, uh, earlier on as a as a united front way yeah. of operating politically. Well, Dr. Parker, thank you for taking your time and talking with me today. We are up to about an hour. Wherever you are watching or listening to the show, there are links in the description to the pamphlet, Stalinist Realism and Identity. Is there anything else you want to hawk, Dr. Parker? Well, the time has flown, hasn't it? Um, and we didn't talk about the way that Stalinist realism plays its way out in psychiatry, <laughs> in which we're told that we no. have some kind of identity, or in psychoanalysis, where the psychoanalysts today, so many of them, are obsessed with the identity of men. Well, men. Before, look, before, look, if I have you for a little bit longer, if I have you for five more minutes, if I can, <laughs> I can pester you for five more minutes, can we, can we hit on uh, Stalinist realism in psychiatry? Because I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that we hear, we see it there uh, played out in miniature, if you like, mm -hmm. from the world scale where you have a uh, conflict between capitalist realism and Stalinist realism. You have it played out in psychiatry where on the capitalist realist side of the equation you have the mainstream psychiatrists who tell you that if you're feeling bad about the world if you're feeling that uh, things aren't making sense then maybe you're depressed and you need to pop the pills mm -hmm. and if you resist then maybe you need to have some ect or electroshock to kind of bang some sense into you the flip side of that is a Stalinist realist kind of re reasoning that also takes psychiatry, uh, psychiatry as a kind of given and tells you that there is this real thing called depression and that we need to find forms of order 
that will uh, put things in place so that people can be made happy again. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is to move beyond that dichotomy between a capitalist realism, use of psychiatry, mm -hmm. and a Stalinist realist uh, understanding of who we are as something fixed in our identities. We need to move beyond that into some of the more what I would call open communist ways of thinking about identity, which work with the survivor movements inside the uh, psychiatric hospitals, that work with the lesbian and gay critiques of psychiatry, mm -hmm. that also work with the neurodiverse movements that have a much more fluid understanding of what identity is, which is critical of any kind of realist claim. That is, they're critical of any kind of claim that tells you that the experts can tell you what you really are. Yeah? Mm. Interesting. And the same thing applies in psychoanalysis, of course, which I mm. think is uh, potentially um, a way of thinking of well, what goes beyond us in mm. our un unconscious attachments mm. to forms of order and ways of moving beyond what we're told we are to finding out what we can be as we transform ourselves in the clinic and then transform ourselves working collectively with others to change the world. That's basically what it boils down to. I mean, we can, again, it, I know you have a limited amount of time, but uh, you kind of talk about depression a little bit in your in your book, and it feels like you talk about depression in the pharmaceutical industry, and I, and I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place, uh, but <sighs> there is a reality that, look, I'm feeling a certain way, here's a pill, shut up, go back to work. Is that part of the capitalist realism? Well, that's, that's the key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, the key is, and this is what is uh, described so well in a recent book, by Robert Chapman called The Empire of Normality. Of Normality. And I, I, I popped in a reference to Robert Chapman's book uh, into the um, end of the essay on psychiatry mm -hmm. in this pamphlet because I just read his book and, uh, or read their book, I should mm -hmm. say, and they had described what was happening so well. That mm -hmm. this is the key. You've got to be able to take the pill so you can go back and be a good worker. Mm -hmm. There isn't space in this kind of capitalist world that we live in for us to be unproductive. Yeah? We're always yeah. talking about what is this to be a good worker? What is this to be productive? Well, the question is, productive for who? You know, mm -hmm. Productive for those who exploit us mm -hmm. and are making profits out of our labor. Surely we should be against that. And I would say that the Stalinist realism threat is important here as well, because the Stalinist realists also have their own idea about what is productive, which I think mm. we should re resist as well. I don't want a world in which everyone has to be productive. <laughs> you know, I want a world in which we can be creative producing useful things, producing beautiful things, or be creative, producing nothing at all. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, it takes all sorts to have a world. And I think we can only have that kind of world where we're free to engage creatively in the labor process or to do many of the other things that it takes to be a human being under communism. That's the world that we're fighting for. It, I mean, it's interesting that we talk about uh, production and, and time because I feel like leisure time is a thing of the past. Um, if you have any leisure time, if there's any hobbies that one has had, they have to be commodified. Sure. Um, that goes into what I've been talking about. You know, uh, I've been reading some Frankfurt School. I don't know if you're a fan of, of Adorno at all or, or care for some of that stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. um the new opiate of the masses is kind of being 
the you know the culture industry is what the those guys say in the 30s and 40s and i feel like we're in a moment where everyone is their own billboard and constantly branding themselves as something um constantly selling whatever it is um there's a store called etsy that's just kind of hobby things it's things that we would have done in our leisure time right you hey i learned how to make a candle the other day and it's fun you know you make candles and uh oh i knitted this thing for my kid and my friend liked it and i made one for them now we put it up on a website and sell it to people all over the world our hobbies um can we even see leisure time anymore is that gone from our imagination? Well, this is the condition of life under neoliberal capitalism, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. That you don't only admire the big entrepreneurs, but you have to be an entrepreneur yourself. You have to be a little entrepreneur of yourself and sell yourself. And if you can't sell your labor power to a big enterprise, you have to find a way Mm -hmm. of dividing yourself so that you become your own exploiter. Huh? So you have mm -hmm. a replication of the capitalist labor process down into the interior of each individual so that they become part of the problem and become attached to capitalism and capitalist modes of being and so reluctant to go beyond that. Difficult to break from that. and. That's why you know, the, the difference between this kind of consumerist, entrepreneurial way of being and a collective response is so important. The collective response shows you a different world, a different way of being, a way of being where we care for each other, where we look out for each other, where we're thinking about how we can support each other. And okay, it's not communism in the here and now, but in a way it kind of prefigures or anticipates the kind of world that we want to live in, huh? that world of care and support. Mm -hmm. We've got to think about how to build that wherever we can in order to counter that a uh, little entrepreneur mindset <laughs> that, that you've just described. It's a real task that we've mm -hmm. got. Um, and I think the way to key into that is to also take seriously and to value the many different ways in which people think of their identities. Think of their identities as men or women or trans or queer or mm -hmm. lesbian, gay or bi or mm -hmm. whatever. Huh? Mm -hmm. To think about their identities and to transform them, to play with them, to be open to the possibilities that there are to be a human being in this world in different kinds of relation to each other, not to be one fixed thing. So it's a, a source of energy and possibility that I think is absolutely necessary to the communist movement. And it, it kind of like works in absolute diametric opposition to the kind of old, gray, fixed forms of Marxism that operate as a kind of worldview where you mm -hmm. have to fall in line and which they tell you how you should think and what your identity should be um, and how you should interpret the world. Well, Dr. Parker, I took you longer than an hour. So thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the extra time, eh? <laughs> hey, thanks for making the time for me. Again, wherever you are watching or listening to this program, there are links in the description to the book, Stalinist Realism and Identity. We're on the same publishing label. I'm so used to being in the music world. Look at it as a label. Uh, if you've checked out I'm a Teenage Anarchist that I wrote, please check out Stalinist Realism and Identity. And also, if you like what you see, 
and you'd like to support what we do, you have the means and you feel so inclined, become a patron. You get access to the bonus champagne rooms. You get to join us for movie nights. You get access to our Discord server. You can ask me questions directly about this show, which you weren't able to do because it wasn't live. So thank you, Dr. Parker. And we are out.